because he first loved me. Those are some powerful words. To say, oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. I think sometimes we forget that it starts with Jesus. It doesn't start with you or me. It starts with him. Before I was born, before any of you knew my name, before my parents knew that I was going to exist, Jesus loved me. He loved me enough to die on the cross so that I could have eternal life with him. So, oh, how I love Jesus. You know, we have a new vision for 2018. How many of you can say what our vision is? I hope more than that. Connect, grow, serve, go. At the South Point Seventh-day Adventist Church, we want every person to connect not only with their Creator, but also with their community. We want each person to grow deeper in their relationship with Christ and help someone else to do the same. We want each and every single member of the South Point Church to serve, not only here locally in our church, but also in our community. And finally, we are called to go and spread the good news of Jesus Christ with everyone we meet. All right? So if I asked you what the vision for South Point is, it's to connect, grow, serve, and go. All right, I saved one last announcement for right before my sermon. What is happening today at 4 p.m.? There is an evangelism training at Orange Cove Seventh-day Adventist Church. We want all of you to attend. I would love to fill Orange Cove with South Point members. Amen? And so this topic for today is reaching the next generation through healthy churches. Anybody want to be a healthy church? Let me ask you, anybody want to be a sick church? We, we, we don't normally say that, but sometimes we say that. So we want you to come and learn about what it is to reach our next generation, our young people that we're losing out the door through healthy churches. So we invite you to come at 4 o'clock at the Orange Park Church. I'm not saying I'm going to take attendance, but I might take attendance. All right? If you have your Bibles with you, open them up to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, and we'll pray as we begin. Father God, we are so thankful for your word. We're so thankful that we have an opportunity to grow in our relationship with you. Father, we're so thankful for what you do for each and every single one of us every day. And Father, we pray that today you will speak from on high, speak into our hearts, teach us something new, and bring us close to you. That is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, as a kid, there was two questions I always asked. Like any good child, what's the first question? Why? Why? Why do we do this? Why do I have to go to church? Why do I need to do this? Why was my favorite question? Because here's the thing. Once I understood the why, I could make a decision whether I was going to do it or not. So essentially what happened was, when you could explain the why to me, and I decided that made sense, I would do it. If you couldn't explain the why to me, then I chose not to do it. The worst why that I hated, the worst answer to that was my father's because I said so. I said I would never say that to my children. I had foster children. And out of my mouth came, because I said so. I now understood my father. (laughs) 
And so, like I said, the why for me was something that was incredibly important. And you know, when we talk about what it means to grow, because this month's topic is growing in our relationship with Christ, I think that we understand why we have to grow. Does everybody understand why we have to grow? You can't stay a baby all of your life. You have to go through the process and become an adult. You can't just decide to come to the Lord and then decide, I'm going to stop right where I am because I think that's what's best for me. So I, th- I don't think there's anyone in this room that debates the why of growing. Why do we have to grow? But I think sometimes the second question that I always asked is just as important, which is how? First question was why. The second question is how. Because sometimes when we look at the how, we're very good at teaching the why, but very seldomly do we teach the how. Anybody see a problem in that? Let me give you an example. What if I told you that I went to the library What if I told you that I took out every book that they had on anatomy and physiology? What if I told you that I read every single book that there was in regards to surgery? What if I told you that I had studied and studied and studied? How many of you would let me cut you open? Any, t- any takers? There's a few. couple. You know, here's the thing. Let me, let me give you another example. What if I went to the library and looked up everything on avionics? I looked at how to fly a plane. I did all of the training and I looked online and I got on a computer and played with things and tried to figure out how many of you would let me fly your airplane for vacation? Okay, there's a lot of things in life that require somebody to physically teach you in order to do properly, okay? My brother is at Loma Linda right now studying to be a surgeon. He has teachers that are literally standing there next to him as he cuts up a cadaver, They don't let you practice on live people. They start with the dead ones. And then you get to move to the live people if you do well on the dead ones. (laughs) I told him his mortality rate was terrible. (laughs) But, but, But here's the thing. There's somebody who's teaching him. There's somebody that's guiding him and giving him instructions on how to do surgery. So let me ask you this. Why do we allow something as powerful and as important as the gospel of Jesus Christ to be done without any practical training? You know, I I, I searched my Bible last night And I did not find one passage of Scripture that says, therefore, go and read this book and start somewhere. Anybody ever found that verse in here? You know, it's amazing that we have an example in Jesus. Jesus took a group of people and he called them his disciples. And so as we as we look at his disciples. Jesus just didn't say, here you go, just do whatever you want. He spent time with each of them individually and as a group training them. For a specific mission and a goal. 
I would like to propose today that this walk that we call Christianity is not done by ourselves. I think there's a a relationship definitely between us and God, but I think there's also a parallel relationship between us and fellow believers. There's an old song that says, no one's a rock, no one's an island. But I'll tell you, a lot of times I find islands in churches. So this morning, my sermon is entitled, Growth Through Others. You know, here's a question. They recently did a survey of all Adventist churches, and they asked the question, how does someone come to know the Lord in the Adventist church? And so they they surveyed a large number of people and they asked what brought you to the church or what brought you to a relationship with Jesus Christ? How did you essentially get here? So I'm going to do that same survey with you guys right now. So I need everyone's participation. All right? So when you hear what applies to you, I want you to raise your hand, okay? So, the first way that someone came to know the Lord, by accident. Anybody uh, come to know the Lord by accident? You know, I, I, I have actually heard a story of a guy who was tired of his life, looked up churches in his area, and went, I'm going to go to this one. Anybody, is that your story? Nobody. How about, now I want to make sure this is clear, studying God's word and then trying to find a church that matches those beliefs, but without the help of another person, by yourself. All right, we've got one. Anybody else? All right, so we have one. Okay. Third one. By a flyer from an evangelistic series sent to you via the postal service. Anybody? Flyer for an evangelistic series sent to you by the postal service. We have one, two, three. All right, so we have three. These numbers are getting better. All right. By a television program, 3ABN, It Is Written, um, Hope Channel, any of those. Any sort of just television media. We've got one, all right? What, 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 what's going on here, okay? I'm three quarters of my way through my list. Let's see if this gets a few more. By a friend. The reason why you're in this church is because a friend or a co-worker or somebody that knew you invited you and brought you to church. How many of you, that is, that is your story? All right. Finally, by a family member. All right, keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. All right, look around this room. By a family member. What if I said a friend and a family member, both combined? Add in those hands, okay? By a friend and a family member, or both, like a mixture of the two. All right, you can put your hands down. According to their study, and guess what? Their study is true. They said around 83% of people were either brought in by a friend or a family member. 
Those who were brought in according to a flyer by accident studying the Word of God television program was less than 3%. All right? Less than 3%. So here's what matters. Understand that you will play a significant role in someone's salvation. Because you just told me that most of you came into this church because of a friend or family member. Therefore, I propose to you that this is not something that we do by ourselves. But rather, it requires others being actively involved in our salvation. Let me ask you this question. How many of you could remember the name of the person who led you to that relationship with Jesus Christ? Could actively say, this is the person. That's incredible. That's a testimony. Let me ask you this. Have you ever said thank you to them? Have you ever gone back and said thank you? Sometimes we need to hear that. That motivates people. When you say to somebody, the reason why I'm in the kingdom of God is because you took a chance. So please, don't ever stop taking chances. You know, for me, you know what that name is? Dewey Nelson. I'm going to tell you that name. Dewey Nelson. The reason why I am a pastor and the reason why I am standing here today is because of an 83-year-old man by the name of Dewey Nelson who grabbed me by the back of my shirt collar at 12 years old and said, Hey, kid, sit down next to me and let me tell you something. You will play a significant role in someone's salvation. Luke chapter 5, verse 17. Luke chapter 5, verse 17. Now it happened on a certain day as he was teaching, that he that he's the, referring to is Jesus, that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. You know, I had to, I had to stop myself when I first read this verse because I read the religious leaders, the proud religious leaders, and the teachers of the law, and then I read, and the power of the Lord was there to heal them. Anybody else notice something? Who's the them that the power of the Lord was there to heal? The teachers of the law and the proud religious leaders. That's a little humbling, is it not? Because every once in a while, we need the power of the Holy Spirit to heal us. But, but these, these men, these Pharisees and these teachers had come to this place where Jesus was, and they had come out of every church and every synagogue and every place to be by Jesus. Doesn't that sound great? Except that it wasn't. Okay? There's a difference between being by Jesus and being at the feet of of Jesus. There's a movie out that I love. Anybody like Medea? Tyler Perry, Medea? I love her statement. She says, if I get out of this, I'm going to go by the church. And as she drives by, she says, there, I just went by the church. There's a difference between being by Jesus 
and being at the feet of Jesus. And so these men came not for the sake of learning from Jesus, but rather they wanted to see what was going on. How dare Jesus come to our region, to our place, and start teaching these crazy things about love, forgiveness, and grace. I'm pretty sure I've heard churches that would have said the same thing. How dare Jesus talk about love, forgiveness, and grace, and mercy in my church? That is not allowed. But, anyways... The Bible says that these men, and, and it says that the power of the Lord was present to heal them. There was something happening here. This was a situation. Let's read on. It says, Then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. Again, the him being Jesus. Here we have a situation. Here was this man that was paralyzed. According to Jewish culture, if a person was paralyzed, it was because of some severe sin in their life. So if you saw a paralyzed person on the side of the road, you didn't feel bad for them because it was something that they did. They deserved it. They got what was coming to them. Anybody ever got what was coming to them? Anybody ever found themselves in a situation? You know, here's the thing. I'm not going to ask you, but I'm going to ask you, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but I'm going to ask you to think about the answer to this question. When God found you, were you in a situation? Because guess what? When God found me, I was in a situation. And normally, most people, when God finds them, they're in a situation. They've, ever, they've either experienced some sort of loss, they've lost their job, they're dealing with addiction, they're dealing with issues and problems, and you know, very seldomly do we find somebody who's perfectly ready to be baptized and ready to go... That doesn't happen anymore. The days of mailing out a flyer and having somebody come to the church and get baptized after knowing absolutely no one is over. But if we are actively involved in the salvation of others, then we're going to have to deal with situations. That's how... Paul was talking when he said to be in the world, but not of the world. Because we're going to have to deal with people and situations and things that are going to happen. But here's what has to happen. There has to be someone that's willing to deal with the situation. And it says that these four men brought this man to Jesus. Now the Bible doesn't say what the relationship of these men to this paralyzed man was. But I'm going to take a leap here. Is that okay? I'm going to say that these men were either friends or family. Because you just don't do this level of persistence for someone you don't know. This level of persistence that these men had as they were bringing this person to Jesus is the same level that you would have if you were going to bring your own child to Jesus. You know, I like the way Brother Marchado said it during Legacy of Hope. He says, if it is an illegal, immoral, or unethical, and it will lead someone to Jesus, then we need to be trying it. 
We can't be willing to say, well, that's just not who we are. We've never done that before. You know what? If it's going to lead someone to a relationship with Jesus Christ, would you not be willing to do whatever it took to bring your child or your mother or your father to a relationship with Jesus Christ? But again, this, th this man, if it was for himself, he couldn't have done it on his own. There had to be someone in his life that was willing to do whatever it took to get him to Jesus. Are you doing that for someone else? Have you narrowed down who that person is that you're willing to do absolutely anything to lead them to a relationship with Jesus Christ. Because here's the thing. We, we talked about this persistence. Guess what? Today in this world, to bring someone to a relationship with Jesus Christ takes persistence. It's not like I'm going to walk over and go, hey, would you like to come to church? Let's go get saved. All right, next week, oh, come on, let's come to church. You know what? I had somebody who once came to church. You know why he came to church? To shut me up. I asked him every single week, two to three times a week, if he would come to church. I am persistent. Know that I will not stop. So he came to church just to get me to stop asking him. Guess what? He got saved that day. Guess what? He called me next week and asked me if I'd like to go to church. It takes persistence. We live in a world where there's so many distractions that you can't just say something once. Ask a husband. Ask a husband to do anything. It takes at least four times. So why do we think something as important as the gospel only requires one time of asking? We have to be persistent. Parents, if you have a child that is outside of a relationship with Jesus Christ, you need to be persistent. You need to get on their case. Because this is a life or death issue and there is no time to play however there's more than just this there's more than just a persistence you know here's what i love about these men and it says that and when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd. Let's stop right there. What do you think they did? No, no, no. They just said, I'm sorry. There's nothing I can do. Don't you see? There's people there. I, I, I just, I don't see how this can be done. So therefore, I'm sorry. I did my best. But you're not going to get to know Jesus today. Do you think that's what they did? Is that what we do? We reach that first hurdle. And it's like, and jump. And jump. And jump. Oh, well, we tried. Wait a second. No, the Bible says that when they, when they couldn't figure it out, they went up on the top of the housetop and they let him down with his bed through the tilling into the midst before Jesus. Okay, I want to know what type of person this was who said, let's go cut the roof open. That's an intense person. That's a persistent person. When they said, oh, there's not a way in through the door, well, let's make another opening. 
and I'm pretty sure Brother David could teach you how to fill that opening after it's done. But, 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 but that was the persistence. There was something that was happening. There was nothing that was going to stop these men from getting their friend or their family member to Jesus. So not only are we have to be willing to help do whatever it takes to get someone to Jesus, we also have to be a remover of hurdles. You know, I will tell you, we're much better at putting in hurdles than we are at removing hurdles. You know what? I once had somebody lovingly tell me that before someone was to be baptized, they needed at least 16 weeks of uh, baptismal studies. They wanted to make that the rule. They wanted to make that the rule. You know, that's very different than what Acts chapter 8 says when it talks about Philip and the Ethiopian. They were driving down the road in their chariot, and as they saw this man, he said, explain it to me, and, he, and, and Philip explained it to this Ethiopian eunuch, and at the end of it, they said, here's water, what stops me? We need to be willing to remove whatever hurdle it is that's in front of people from reaching Jesus Christ. Because here's the thing, I have heard people say all kinds of things. You have to stop smoking before you can be baptized. You have to stop sinning before you get to be baptized. You have to stop this or that. Do you not realize that the only way that we have power to overcome sin is through Jesus Christ? So what we're asking people to do is to have power over sin without the power of Jesus Christ. It ain't going to happen. It can only be through Jesus Christ that there is victory over sin. We need to be the ones that are removing hurdles rather than the ones that are putting the hurdles in the place of them. So you know what? If there's a hurdle that's keeping someone from Jesus... We have to be willing to go over it, go under it, go around it, or if you're in the military, blow it up. Do you know what the running joke in the Marine Corps, do you know the only thing that stops a Marine? A lack of C4. The only thing that stops a Marine is a lack of C4. We have to be willing to do whatever it takes. And guess what? Sometimes those hurdles are things that we see and know and love and respect. I didn't get any amens on that one. Some of those hurdles are things that we hold dearly. Because this is how I grew up. This is how I know church to be. This is what I think Jesus asked of us. But the problem is, it's not biblical. We have to be careful that we're not setting hurdles that Jesus isn't asking us to jump over. But these men, brought this man before Jesus. They did whatever it took. They didn't let anything stop them. You know what? I hope that I have friends like that. You know, there was a recent article that I read, and I actually brought the article with me if anybody wants to read it. Forbes magazine. Anybody ever heard of it? Forbes magazine said, listed an article on how to be successful. Anybody ever want to be successful? Successful things are related. So if you want to be successful, the principle is the same, whether it's at business or in a relationship with Jesus Christ or at bringing people to God. Rule number one, analyze the people around you. 
Know who you're surrounding yourself with. Are they people that are going to help move you forward or backwards? Number two, filter out negativity. In the words of a generation that came after me, nobody's got time for that. Number three, dedicate time to the relationships. I'm going to read this word for word. It says, one of the reasons we dread going back to work on Monday is we don't feel we've spent enough time with the people who matter. Our lives are so busy that sometimes we have to dedicate the time to interact with the people who mean the most to us. If you need to schedule time to keep in touch with family and friends, put it on a calendar. It almost sounded like it came out of here, didn't it? That's Forbes magazine. We have to be about relationships. We have to be willing to be the person that's willing to do anything to lead someone to Jesus Christ. If it isn't illegal, unethical, immoral, and someone's going to get to know the Lord, we need to be doing it. We need to be a remover of hurdles. We need to make it the simplest process that there is to bring someone to Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one who can fix them, not me, not you. We're called to be fishers of men. The Bible says that he will clean them. Let's read on. When he saw their faith, who's the there? Who? His friends, his family members. When he saw the faith of these four men, he saw their faith. God acknowledges, God sees this. And because of that, he said, Man, your sins are forgiven you. At that moment, I guarantee that his friends on the roof were jumping for joy. Now, we know what's about to happen, but I guarantee that his friends up on the roof were jumping for joy because their main objective and their goal was to bring their friend to Jesus. And so Jesus spoke as one who had authority. You know, if you did something wrong to me, I can say, I forgive you. But if you do something wrong to ten other people, do I have the ability to say, I forgive you for all of them as well? The only person who can do that is Jesus. So that's why these teachers, these law keepers, these these religious leaders had such a problem. How dare this man talk as if he is God? Somebody once asked me, who died and left you God? Here's what it says. But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, You can't keep your thoughts secret from Jesus. If you think it, it's already been done. So if you're sitting there thinking, this pastor's crazy, what's he talking about? Jesus already knows that. But it says, when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, why are you reasoning in your hearts? I would word it a little bit. What is your problem? What is your problem? 
That's the way I would have said it. But it says, why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise up and walk? That's a pretty easy question. Because if I say to you, Trisha, your sins are forgiven. You're like, thank you. It doesn't mean anything. You don't have the ability to do that. But at least I know you think my sins are forgiven. There, there's no evidence of anything happening to Trisha because I said your sins are forgiven. Now, we know who Jesus is. So it's different when Jesus says your sons are forgiven versus when Pastor Amos says your sins are forgiven. My words mean nothing. Jesus' me words mean everything. And so when he said, your sins are forgiven, he's saying, which one's easier for me to say? Well, it's easier for me to say, your sins are forgiven. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. You know, at that moment, that man had a choice. That paralyzed man had a choice. Either he was going to listen, or he wasn't. That man could have chose to stay on that mat. Here's the thing. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Our job is to get people to the foot of Jesus Christ. At that point, they have to make a decision for themselves. But that doesn't mean that that person has to make that decision by themselves. Because I'm pretty sure that the reason why this man did what he did in the next verse was because he had people on that roof that were supporting him, that were praying for him, that were willing to get any, to do anything to get him to Jesus, who were willing to remove any hurdle that was in his way. The next word, verse 25, immediately... immediately what type of things do we do immediately the house is on fire get out immediately here's a million dollars come take it from me immediately immediately connotates a different level of reaction without hesitation without recourse, without any issue, without any problem, without any thought. At that very moment, when Jesus said, take up your bed and walk, immediately that man got up. Because I guarantee he asked questions along the way. Hey guys, where are you taking me? What are you doing? Why are you cutting into somebody's roof? Are you serious? What is wrong with you? You're that serious about this person named Jesus Christ that you're willing to cut a hole in the roof for me to be able to be lowered down just so I can spend time with this Jesus. That makes no sense. But the moment that Jesus said, your sins are forgiven, and he understood and began to know who Jesus was, the response was immediate. Because you can't be in the presence of Jesus Christ and not be changed. There's one last step for us as Christians. 
It says this. It says, Immediately he rose up before them, took up what he had been lying on, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. I think there's somebody who probably would have yelled at him for carrying his bed. You know what his response was? I don't care. Let me tell you what Jesus just did for me. You know, one of the things that I think that we forget sometimes is that we forget to glorify God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. Like I said in the beginning, for me, God found me in a situation. I thank God every day for the person by the name of Dewey Nelson who found me as a teenager, grabbed me by the back of my collar, and invested in my life. And I know that it wasn't him, but it was God dwelling in him. So I will tell that story every single opportunity of who it was that brought me to a relationship with Jesus Christ. Sometimes I think we get into our relationship with God. Anybody ever thought that the people at church are perfect? Like they have all of it together? Now, I'm not saying do you believe they really are perfect, but do, do people normally look perfect at church? They're dressed up, they've got their ties, they've got their suits. Their entire life could be falling apart, and you can sit there and shake their hands, and they will smile at you. While their life is falling apart. Sometimes I think we need to stop forgetting what God has done for us. And start sharing with, with others what Jesus has done for us. Because people need to know that my God still works today. That my God is still working in this world. And with all this stuff that we have going on, with a world that's falling around, uh, apart around us, that Jesus Christ is still changing lives today. And here's the thing. You are going to be actively involved in someone's salvation if you're willing to be the type of friend or family member that God has called you to be. And I guarantee you, if you're that type of person, that one day when we get to heaven, somebody's going to walk up to you and say, the reason why I'm here is because of you. And you know what? There's people that I'm going to walk up to and that you're going to walk up to and say the reason why I'm here is because of what you did in my life. We're going to invite our praise team to come up as we close tonight, today. And we're going to sing our closing
bring light to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken great are you Lord it's your someone here that there's been a hurdle in their way or something that is keeping you from the relationship that you want to have with Jesus we want to be a church that removes hurdles so whatever it is in your life that you need today's the day to say you know what we're going to deal with that is there someone here that needs a hurdle removed is there someone here that says, I need to give my life to the Lord? Is there someone here that says that I need to start my relationship over? That I need a fresh beginning? Is that anyone here? Raise your hand. Let's pray. Father God, we come today with hearts and minds that are focused on you. Father, we know that there is joy in heaven when someone comes to know the Lord. Father, we pray that today that every heart and mind in this place can be assured of salvation. Because the Bible says that every tongue that confesses that, it, that Jesus is Lord, if they believe in their heart that he has been raised from the dead, that he died for their sins, that they will be saved. Father, we are so thankful for your love and your compassion and your grace towards us. So Father, today we ask that as we leave this place that we not leave the same, but rather that we be different, that we be changed by your grace and your mercy. Father, may you put the person in our lives that we're going to be actively involved in their salvation. Father, make it clear to us. Father, take out any reservations that we may have to leading that person to Jesus. Father, we know that we can't change them, we can't make them better, but we know that Jesus can. That victory over sin and death comes through none other than Jesus Christ. So Father, we pray that we will bring people to your feet, that you will speak into their lives and into their hearts, and that they will ultimately choose you as their Savior. Father, we pray to continue to be a, a beacon of light in our community, that people will see Jesus in each of us and want to know who you are. That is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. It's, it's your bread in my